What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's finally the night that nobody's been waiting for. So enjoy the shit show. Welcome to the prediction show for UFC on ESPN 15, Pedro Munoz vs. Frankie Edgar. We've got two free plays that we're going to talk about on this card. Actually, really one free play and a prop bet. This card is a little thin when it comes betting-wise, but I do like three plays up for clients, up on Wager Talk. Link down in the description. Uh, besides those three plays, more most of the time I've got you know four client plays, maybe two or three free plays. This card was a little bit more thin, really focused on those three client plays, and uh, and have one really free play and a prop bet that I do want to discuss. But with the extra time here that I do have, instead of just diving into the one free play uh, and the prop bet, I want to talk a little bit about what a lot of people always you know direct message me about, comment about, you know, kind of how I tier my bets, how I'm betting, you know, you know, how do I bet the free plays? How do I bet the client plays? You know, am I, you know, how am I looping certain things together? Am I betting over-unders? You know, how am I kind of really working my bankroll? And I thought this was going to be a great time just quickly to kind of go over a couple points that I wrote down here, to kind of go over what I do, how I do it, and, uh, and kind of give you a little more insight into that because I know a lot of people have asked me about it, so I figured this is probably the best way to do it. Um, so really the way that I look at it, the first part about this, and I want to kind of dive right into it, is really look at it like the stock market. Now, a lot of people always, when they, you know, they're, they're, they're gambling or they're betting, they're really just looking for that night and they want to win that night. And we all do. I mean, trust me, every single person that's watching this video that is sports betting in the entire country, the entire world, they want to win every night. That's not absolutely, the math is against you completely to win every night. You just can't do it. But the point of it is you want to be better. You want to be a sharp better. You want to have a betting edge when you're placing these wagers. So when you look at it, as long as you're trending up, and then the stock market doesn't always go up. It goes maybe you know up 5%, down 3%, up 4%, down 2%, maybe down 8%, then back up. To, so it, you're hoping that the trend in the long run, in over a 12-month period, you're going to be profitable by the end of the year. That's what you have to do. Now, right now for this year, I am at 43% return on investment for clients. Which is fantastic, it's great, and if I had told people beginning of this year, you know, nine months ago, because UFC pretty much has not stopped, uh, if I told people, hey, 43%, or I'm a financial advisor, you're gonna get 43% returning your money, every single person would probably take that. It's a great return when it comes to sports betting, or any return, pretty much overall. Um, but you have to look at it in the long run. So that's the first thing, you really gotta look at this as the long run, as a business, um, not as a one night. I know there's casual betters that just, you know, are looking for some action, want to have some fun. I can, you know, I can appreciate that side of it as well. But if you're looking to kind of make more of a return, if you're looking to really take it more serious, this is really the way that I do it. There's many ways to do it, but this is the way that I typically do it. So the first part of it also is that I have an allotted amount of money per event that I use. And it's not going to be, you know, I'm not, you know, really just, you know, spreading it around all, you know, all through. I have a strategy that I use. I know I've said this on a couple other shows before, but I wanted to, again, touch on it a little bit. And my, my way, basically, is I'm tiering my bets. Now, 80% of my allotted, 80 to 85% of my allotted amount of money per event is going on my client plays. Those are my plays that I feel that are my strongest plays, that are graded my strongest plays, and those are the ones I'm betting straight. Now, a lot of people like to parlay them. A lot of people want to, you know, hit all three, hit all four, and we're going to touch on that in a minute. Um, and that's great, too. You know, that's, that's part of it. And again, that's part of a portfolio. You want to have the upside, but you also want to have the apples and, you know, the, the, you know, the strong, you know, really stocks that are going to really get you those returns and you're not looking to really, you know, of course, tie it all up into one big parlay. So the big part there is 80% of that is going to be going into my client plays. Those are the ones that I feel strongest about. Those are the ones that I am definitely going to be giving out as these are ones you take, you bet them straight. You see them when I put them up. When I do my write-ups, there's a percentage next to them. I'm grading them as a higher play than a free play. Now, 15 to 20%, the other 15, 20% of my light amount of money per event 
is going to be the free plays. It's going to be the parlays. It's going to be value plays. I'm going to be finding spots in there that I can say, hey, I'm going to tie this together with maybe one of my client plays because there's great upside. This line's off, and yet I don't want to. I don't want to be hammering this one straight, but boy, this has got this has got some nice uh, upside to it. Those are the kind of things that I'm going to be doing when it comes to that, and that's best the best way in a in a vacuum to really to really look long term because you can't make money parlaying everything. You just can't. I mean, it's going to be part of it. And there's, you know, two weeks ago, I went 4-0 no on the client plays. Yes, you know, I, I tier a couple bets together and, and I, you know, parlay a couple, but I'm betting all four of those straight. And then if there's an opportunity where I am going to be hitting parlays, that just is going to magnify your return for that event. And then I'm not actually going to be in the next event. All of a sudden, bet more because it was a great event. Now I'm betting more. You can't do that. That's just an impossibility for you to win long term. So that's what I'm going to be doing there. Um... I already touched on that part is you can't live on parlays. I know people love them. And, and there's a reason why you put a little bit of money. And then when it shows how much you could possibly make, there's a lot of money. Uh, there's a reason because it's hard to hit. And, and yes, we've all hit them. And, you know, it feels great when, you, you know, you hit a four-teamer or you hit a whatever it may be, even higher, you know, a three-teamer. And you've got whatever it may be. It feels great. They're hard to hit. But it can't be the, the overall amount of money or the biggest amount of money that you're going to be spending for that event. Um... And the big part of also parlays is you're just leveraging odds. You're just looking to say, hey, I'm going to have a big chunk of my money is going to be on these straight plays, but I'm going to leverage some odds and help myself out if I do sweep or if I do find a nice little run here, I can then really leverage those odds and really multiply your return. Uh, the other part is bankroll management. I know people regurgitate this everywhere we go, but it is a reason for that because it's so important. You could be a 90% capper and not have proper bankroll management and lose money. Um, whether you're chasing, you know, there's been points where, and actually talked to a couple people too, where, you know, they, you know, um, you know, had the Burns and O'Malley parlay and then, you know, Burns loses and then people are hammering O'Malley. For me, once I place my money, that is it for the event. That is it because there are so many events. There's no reason to chase in the next one or chase on the next one or, or, you know, uh, you know, you lose one fight, you're going to double up on the next one. That's exactly how the books make money because at that point, you're not capping. There's no betting edge. You're just looking to just hit something and figuring, I'm due. And obviously, uh, that's another term that I completely hate is the I'm due term uh, because it's, that doesn't mean anything. It's, you know, it's equal depending on whatever bet. Um, that's a whole other story there. But you really have to treat it like a business. And that's the way that I do it. I really treat it like a business. That's the only way you're going to make it long term because a business owner – would not just make wild decisions. You know, they wouldn't just say, hey, and, and instead of sitting in a boardroom and making a very calculated strategic move, uh, they don't just, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy this part or I'm gonna expand the business to do this. You really have to go in there and have the right mind frame to go in and make these decisions. And again, the great part about UFC is that there is no off season. You can consistently bet it all year round, 45 events basically in the year. There's just a ton of time to do it. And there's no need, whether you have a good night or a bad night, there's going to be one next weekend. And I start capping pretty much as soon as my client plays go out on, on Tuesday and I'm done doing shows Tuesday, Wednesday, and that, in that range, uh, I'm already capping the next event because I want to get ahead of the number. I want to start looking at it. So you have to have a, a strategy going into each week in order to really find success in this. Um, and the other thing I hate is where people want to take a shot. Now that is, I hate that phrase I can't stand that phrase that that phrase to me is is just overdone it's almost like you're kind of you know I'm going to take a shot at this you know this plus 200 um, and it's almost a way for a capper to almost feel like they uh, like even if they lose it's not a big deal I took a shot if they win okay they went so it's almost like a soft spot to kind of kind of give a play in that aspect and for me I don't do that because if I, even though there's been, been certain positions too where, you know, a free play didn't happen. You know, I had um, a free play last week, didn't happen, fight was canceled, and I don't have another one behind that. It's not, I may have a lean or something I'm interested in, or if somebody asks me, hey, what do you think of this? I could give you some, you know, give some advice, and I have no problem doing that. Am I betting some of those? Most of them I'm not, and I, and I am very transparent on that where I say, listen, this is who I think could win. 
uh, but I'm not betting it because I already have my plays. I, I bet my plays. I bet the lines I want. I've got them at the price I want, and that's it. And even if something falls off the card and someone gets COVID or an injury, I'm done with that with that fight or that event. I already have my plays all set up. So you have to do that. So when everyone says take a shot at this, I have to find value. I have to find a betting edge. And any person that's betting, you should think of it in that way because you have to have that betting edge in order to find a spot long term to make money. Um, and the other term I can't stand is playing with house money. It's not house money, it's your money. So if you go out there and, and you win uh, early in the prelims and you, you win whatever amount of money it is, you win a thousand bucks in the prelims and you're happy about it and now you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay a little bit more on these few fights, it's house money, it's, a, it's your money. So you gotta think that way also, that it's not house money because it becomes their money if you give it right back to them. It's your money when it's in your bank account or in your account, whatever it is, your book you're using, and it's, you're giving it back to them. So you gotta think again, business decisions, that's the way that you're gonna win long term. 45 events overall, lots of time to make money. So that's pretty much all I wanna talk about. I don't know if I kinda of rambled there, but pretty much wanted to cover a couple of the things there. Let me know what you guys think, You know, comment, whatever it is, got questions or anything else. I, I, again, it's just a good spot right now to kinda of talk about it, just because this is a great time right now to kinda of re, you know, refocus on certain things. It's been a great year. 43% return on investment, 68% uh, winner for the year. It's been a great year, but again, sometimes you gotta look at how you're capping to make sure you're consistently making the right decision long-term. So that is that, and now we will get into the free play. Um, so the first, not the first, pretty much the only free play, but I do have two plays on the main event, and uh, one is gonna be a side, one of them is gonna be a, a, a prop, and just kinda wanted to touch on them. But what we're gonna do, like we always do here on the, on, the, uh, on the show here, is we're gonna talk about the last three fights for each fighter, and we're gonna talk about the main event of the evening between Pedro Munoz and Frankie Edgar. You got right now, the line is roughly, and I'm seeing it start to tick up a little bit, but roughly you've got Munoz anywhere around the minus 220, you've got Frankie around the plus 190 range. Um, and this one here, I think is an interesting fight, Gonna dive into it, and uh, the first side we're gonna be talking about is Pedro Munoz. Three fights ago, he fought um, Brian Caraway. Now, this is a fight here where I thought Caraway looked terrible. I mean, Caraway has, has had some nice spots in there where he's he's definitely won some tough fights, but I thought going into this fight, he looked very flat. Um, he didn't look like he really was with it. Didn't really wasn't really pumped up to be in there, and Pedro just went out and just charged forward. And maybe Caraway was kind of more on the side of kind of getting to the feeling out process, but Pedro capitalized. He went out there, started firing. He had much faster hands, which Caraway, you know, I've seen it in certain, in certain spots. He's looked pretty sharp. Here he looked, he got a completely obliterated in this spot here. He was getting damaged quickly. It almost looked like he was overwhelmed. Uh, Pedro really showed a lot here, and, and that's one thing that Pedro has showed a lot, is that he's definitely continues to evolve his striking. You know, he's, he was more of a dirty boxer, you know, grappler, kind of getting in tight, and he's kind of really sharpened up those striking skills. It showed here against Brian Caraway. He goes out there and gets a TKO victory in round one over Caraway. Uh, two fights ago, uh, Munez fought uh, Cody Garbrandt. Now, this was a very interesting fight to me. Um, I think that this is one that, again, it's, it, it, it really kind of ties into the way that Cody has fought over his last few fights. This was a fight where Cody had just come off back-to-back -back knockout losses to TJ Dillashaw. And in this spot here, you know what, I thought that Cody, this was a great mind frame for Cody. Because Cody going into this fight was talking about he's relaxed, he's calm. Um, these guys definitely had no beef between them. There was no issues between them. There was no uh, trash talking. You know, Pedro was a very soft-spoken guy. Um, didn't really, you know, there was nothing really going on. And Cody kind of had that, hey, I've got this whole new mindset that I'm going to be relaxed, not let my emotions get the best of me. And early in this fight, the one thing that Pedro used, and I think it's something he's going to use on Saturday night, is the leg kicks. I thought that that's, again, another weapon that he has brought to the table compared to other spots where he just wasn't. And this was a great spot where he opened up with a bunch of leg kicks, and that really gave the openings for him to throw strikes to, uh, to Cody's um, uh, chinless chin. Uh, and, and it gave a great opportunity for him to do it as he was mixing it up. It almost threw Cody off a little bit, and that's when Cody got dropped. After Cody got dropped, the side control that Pedro had, I thought that that was going to be almost the end of the night. 
Uh, Pedro's tough under there, but Cody really, you know, he comes to you, he's got that wrestling background, uh, comes from the uh, team alpha male, has some wrestling credentials, but he got up pretty quickly. And as soon as he got up, that is when the emotions once again got to Cody Garbrandt. And that was where it's, it's, a, it's a kill or be killed kind of mentality. Not the greatest thing to do if you're really going to, you know, you know, implement a strategy. And the one thing that Cody does also is he has the wide hooks. He's got fast hands when he's exchanging. I mean, his jab and his straight, and they are just and snapping very fast. But when he's got those hooks, they take a while to get there. And Pedro was able to, even after this fight, Pedro said, you know, we knew that he was going to throw these big hooks and we were going to have the quicker hands in tight as he's looking for the big shots. So after he got dropped, he got back up, uh, and Cody ended up landing. So then Cody ended up landing a nice shot too. And But even in that point, Cody could not just kind of, kind of collect himself find a good opportunity to kind of counter or, or keep moving. He basically just was running after Pedro with no strategy whatsoever, didn't even care. Once he got dropped, I think he was so upset about it, uh, and then he went out there to look for the big shot, and then again, it was just anybody's game. I gotta say, though, that, that Pedro showed that he has a chin, and without a doubt, we've seen what Cody can do when he lands a big hook. He definitely has power. There's no doubt about that. He's got quick hands. There's no doubt about that. But he landed some nice shots on Pedro. Pedro sure showed a lot of durability on his chin, which is, again, something enormous just moving forward in his career that he's got that chin if he's going to look to have those exchanges. Uh, Cody landed those big shots, but Pedro landed the bomb, which basically made uh, um, Cody just, uh, Pedro landed the bomb on Cody. Cody ended up like collapsing like a lawn chair, and uh, that was the end of the night. Pedro swarmed him, got the first round knockout win, and uh, there you have it there. Cody loses to Pedro Munoz. And then most recently, Pedro fought Aljamain Sterling. And this was a fight where really Aljo just, I mean, he looked sensational. And a lot of things that had to do with this fight was that, you know, Pedro definitely has a striking and he continues to evolve, continues to evolve, continues to like, you know, kind of bring it all together, be more well-rounded, which is really great for him. Really, really great for him. But against Aljo, he just, I mean, Aljo looked as smooth as I've ever seen him in any position there. He used his six inch reach advantage, which is very important there. And, and, and Pedro could not really break that distance. He couldn't really get in tight. But just the fact that overall, Aljo just has better striking. I mean, the volume, the big output, the rangey, the, the footwork, everything just really came together. If you've not seen that fight, I, I suggest that if you're just kind of looking at Aljo moving forward in other fights, I thought that he looked sensational there. I mean, really overwhelmed Pedro. It was a sweeping decision victory, and it was even spots where, you know, Pedro was maybe trying to get the takedown or grapple, but just the way that Aljo moved, really next level stuff. We saw what he did to Corey Sanhagen most recently, uh, one of the recent fights for, for Aljamain Sterling. But this was a dominating decision loss, uh, that's the dominating decision win for Aljamain Sterling. Pedro Munoz gets the loss, so there you have it there. Um, and now we're going to talk about Frankie Edgar. Three fights ago, he fought Cub Swanson. This was a fight that was actually at in Atlantic City. Great card, great fight, fun night of partying also. Um, but this was a fight where Frankie came right out, and he started using his jab. And that's something that he definitely has. He's got nice boxing. He's able to kind of, you know, stick and move. But the one thing that kind of stuck with it was that, you know, Cup kind of stayed on the outside. Now, I don't know if there was just a lot of respect for these. Both these guys have a ton of respect for each other. But neither of them really, you know, obviously they're fighting. But there was just nobody really went for it. It was kind of a, almost like a glorified sparring match in a way. Because, you know, you would see Frankie kind of throw a high kick and back off. And maybe a one-two, you know, one-two and back off. And then Cub would kind of do the same thing and back off. And it was, you know, very close rounds. I mean, very, very close rounds. But the big stat and that I thought was that Frankie was 0 for 9 on takedowns. Now, that is his bread and butter. That is the thing that has brought him to the next level. He is a tough guy, durable. You know, he definitely overall is a, is a, is a well-rounded fighter, and, and I'm a fan of him just in general. But if you look at what he did there, that is just a bad sign. I mean, a guy that's kind of tailing off the end of his career and goes 0 for 9, and he's the wrestler. I mean, Cub is well-rounded. Cub has, you know, you know a... a ground credentials, grappling credentials, so he's not, he's no slouch, but Frankie just never had an opportunity, there was just never a chance for him to really get him down, Frankie looked flat, but he did win this in a close decision, Frankie looked flat, I thought, but he goes out there and beats Cub Swanson in a decision, uh, two fights ago, he fought Max Holloway, 
This was a fight here where it was actually the opposite of how Frankie started that first fight, uh, that last fight against Cup Swanson. He kind of came out guns blazing. I mean, he kind of came out there pressed. He wanted to cut that distance. He knew that, you know, one thing about Max Holloway, he's a rangy fighter. He really utilizes his range. He utilizes his long limbs. He really finishes his punches at the end of his punch. He really extends his arm. A lot of good things that he does there and when he's moving around the cage. And really, he was piecing up. Um, uh, Frankie. I mean, pretty much the whole fight. That first round was was kind of close, and then there was a couple somewhat, you know, maybe the second was somewhat, but overall, I mean, Max Holloway just pretty much ran circles around Frankie. Frankie kind of looked his age there, and again, another big stat was that Frankie was 1 for 14 on takedowns, which is just astronomical. I mean, astronomical. I mean, again, Max Holloway has very good takedown defense, so again, another guy that's no slouch, but that's his that's his path to victory. That's the way he, he wins fights. So for him to not be able to do that in, in, in these two fights here shows a lot, says a lot to me. Uh, the only takedown that he had was when really um, Max hurt Frankie and Max kind of went in for the kill and just doing that little opening gave Frankie the opportunity to get that takedown. So obviously, you know, it was one, but one for 14, that's gonna gas him, that tired him out, really trying to fend for a couple of these, I would say maybe even half of these, were just sloppy takedowns. They were just very sloppy takedowns. It wasn't that old tenacious takedowns where he's chaining together uh, his takedowns, getting him up against a fence, picking him up, getting his, you know, getting under, getting, you know, getting the hooks under. He, he, I just didn't really see that much overall in this fight. Again, Max is a world-class fighter as well, but it was a bad showing for him. It was a losing decision for Frankie Edgar. And then uh, most recently, Frankie Edgar fought the Korean Zombie. This was a fight where. Uh, I mean, man, this was just a quick one. Uh, Frankie went out there and quick exchanges early on, right at the beginning of this fight, and Frankie got rocked. I mean, it was a big shot by the zombie. Zombie dropped him, or actually, he kind of kind of was knocked out on his feet for a minute there, and then the zombie just kind of poured it on, got on top of Frankie, hard ground and pound, and even in that scenario too, it wasn't a great position. Zombie had a great, strong top control position on Frankie, but Frankie was really struggling in that position. I mean, right away he got hurt. You've seen him get knocked out a couple other times pretty bad, or, or at least hurt pretty bad. This is a spot where, where Zombie just overwhelmed him, knocked him down. When Frankie got back up, it was uh, it almost looked like they probably should have called it. I honestly think they should have called it when Zombie was on top of him with just vicious grind and pound. They gave Frankie, they gave the vet, they know that he's tough, they gave him the you know a little bit more leeway in this fight. He got back up, got dropped again, fight was over, um, and that was the end of that, a knockout loss for Frankie in the first round. So with that all being said, we've got, uh, you know, obviously you know that Frankie overall is a top level wrestler, tough as, you know, tough as nails, great ground and pound, a former champion. And then you've got on the other side, you've got Munoz, you know, he's a you know, good grappler, got the credentials, really started to tie together a lot of the things that he does, um, you know, with, with the striking as well as the grappling side. And he's added in those leg kicks. I think that's a huge part here. I think that's something he's going to use a lot early on in this fight. I'm telling you, you got to watch for that, that he's going to really set up. He knows it's work for him. Obviously, you know, that's going to help him again, open up the offense for him. I think he's going to use a lot of that. Also the leg kicks. The, I mean, I'm sorry, not legs. Uh, his chin. Even if he's getting hit, he knows he can take it. So he knows he's got the chin. He's utilizing the leg kicks, able to combinations up top. I think that's a very tough spot for somebody like Frank Yeager who has not been able to get the takedowns. And against somebody like Munoz, I don't think, I, I think it's going to be a lot of the same where he's going to struggle for that. In a, in a fight in this situation where you've got an aging fighter, I mean, Frankie's now you know, 38 years old at this point. Um, it's a tough spot to take Frankie Edgar at this point. And you've got a guy that continues to improve. I like the, what Munoz has done. He's really, really improved himself. And I just see the skill set of Frankie deteriorating. You know, there's some guys that when they're in the end of their career, you know, whatever, you kind of see it. We just saw it with Daniel Cormier. You know, Cormier looked great. Uh, you know, even in the loss against um, Stipe in the second fight, Cormier looked great. I mean, he, he, his hands were fast. You know, but even that late, that 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 gap between that first, that second fight and that third fight, I think they were worlds difference. I mean, Cormier looked completely different. I mean, could it be the the quarantine? Could it be anything? But or could it just be his age and just his body is not responding to the way it used to respond? That's kind of the way I look at it here with Frankie Edgar. I just think that at 38 years old, where you know he's done everything, the, the big part also is the mileage, the MMA mileage he has had. 
tons of damage, tons of wars, classic fights that will live on forever. He is going to be, without a doubt, a Hall of Famer. But when you've got a situation here against a guy like Pedro Munoz, I think that is really tying it together, that is really, really moving forward. I mean, he lost to Aljo, but Aljo is a title contender. He, that's who he lost to. I like uh, Pedro Munoz here. I think the line is going to continually tick up here. I got it at minus uh, 220. It's a little bit juicy there, but there's definitely one spot that I'm going to be also taking to is the method of victory, TKO, KO, plus 220. So I'm thinking I'm doing the minus 220 on him to win straight, and I'm sprinkling in the method of victory here to kind of tie that together. I think in a fight like this, I think that Pedro's going to look to put the stamp on it. If it's going to be a standing fight, I don't see this being a grappling fight. I don't see uh, Munoz getting that submission victory. So I'm going in there, Pedro Munoz to win, and then I'm sprinkling in the knockout uh, plus 220. So those is that is the free play and the prop bet play. Hope you guys enjoyed this. I kind of changed it up a little bit because I wanted to actually talk a little bit more about some other things that people are always writing me about. Thought it would be a good time to talk about it on a card that is a little iffy, but there is a great card coming up next. I've got plays already that I do like. I might actually load those plays a little bit earlier in the um, early in the week again because um, I want to make sure we jump on some of these lines. So uh, there you have it. Definitely subscribe if you've not yet done so. Give it a thumbs up. Do all that great stuff. Uh, follow me on Twitter at KyleAnthonyUFC. And this is Kyle Anthony's UFC betting show, and I'll see you next time.